Welcome to the LDN Radio Show, brought to you by the LDN Research Trust. I'm your host, Linda Elsigood. I have an exciting lineup of guest speakers who are LDN experts in their field. We will be discussing low dose naltrexone and its many uses in autoimmune diseases, cancers, etc. Thank you for joining us. Today's show sponsor, Care First Speciality Pharmacy. They are leading compounders of LDN and other custom treatments servicing patients in over 18 states coast to coast. They are widely accredited to provide you with the highest quality demanded by the industry and the expert service you expect. To learn more, call 844-822-7379 or visit cfspharmacy.com. Our guest today is Dr. Jordan Atkinson, who is a naturopathic doctor from Vancouver in Canada. Dr. Jordan believes in being proactive, not reactive, and works with his patients to identify the cause of their illness. He then creates individualised treatment protocols tailored to meet the patient's specific needs. He uses cutting-edge diagnostic labs and therapeutic modalities to enhance the healing process. Dr. Dorden participates in continuing medical education in order to ensure that his patients receive current and optimal safe health care. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Jordan. We're really excited to have you here with us. Thank you so much for having me, Linda. This is a, a pleasure to talk with you about the uses of low-dose nitroxin. I'm excited to talk more about it today with you. Fantastic. First of all, could you tell us what made you decide to become a doctor? Yeah, it's a really good question. When I was in high school, my dad was a career counselor at the high school. And it was a great opportunity with him being a career counselor that he was able to put me into all these different programs where I could job shadow different professions when I was in high school. So once a week, I would spend time with a dentist. Once a week, I'd be a physiotherapist, a stockbroker, a medical doctor, a chiropractor, a naturopathic physician. And I knew when I was in the health-related fields or job shadowing those health-related doctors or physicians um, that I really loved that connection to helping people, solving their problems, making them feel better and looking at the root cause of a lot of their issues. So for me, it was trying to make a difference to help people to improve their lives, and that's what attracted me to to medicine. Wow, that's a really interesting story. And how great for you to be able to try so many, or not try, but to find out more about all these different careers and which would be the right one for you. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who would have thought, oh, I wish I had that opportunity. Um, it's really good. So once you decided and trained, what experience have you had in the field of medicine? Well, I trained, I was, my undergraduate degree was in kinesiology. So it gave me all my prereqs for my, uh, for my medical training. And it was through there that I was most attracted to naturopathic medicine, where I had the use of nutrition, herbs, as well as in Canada, we have pharmaceutical rights. So that's where I started learning more about using naltroxone, low doses of it, um, in conjunction with anti-inflammatory diets, in conjunction with IV Meyer cocktails. So it was when I was going through more schooling and reading about studies and spending time with other doctors that had been in the industry for years and years and learning how with the minute amount of naltroxone that they were getting amazing results uh, with it in conjunction with other therapies. It was pretty amazing to see. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been prescribing LDN? That's a good question. Um, I've been practicing now for about since night, since 2008 here, about eight years, and I've probably been using it for the last four years. Mm -hmm. So I've been quite impressed with the results that I see, and it's, I'm using it for a wide range of patient bases. Um, I, week, I work weekly in an HIV clinic, a satellite clinic, where I'm using low-dose naltroxin with my HIV patients for immune regulation. Um, I use it at the other end of the spectrum, too, where I'm using it with my cancer patients, 
and a lot of the in-between with any of my autoimmune issue patients, so psoriasis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, MS patients, multiple sclerosis, and seeing results with that as well. Wow, that's a, a, quite a range you, you have there. So for those patients that uh, you're prescribing LDN for, have any reported to you any negative side effects? That's a good question. So whenever I'm prescribing any type of uh, drug or supplement, going through side effects is always a key thing, what they may possibly see, even if it is a minute one. The one that I most commonly see with low-dose naltroxone, but again, it's not very often, but if there was one side effect, it's most commonly vivid dreams. So for a lot of my patients that are on a low-dose naltroxone, we start at a low dose. We usually start at 1.5 or 1 milligrams, and they would take that at night. Um, one of the side effects they could get is vivid dreams. So for some people, some of my patients say, oh, I don't dream at all. Um, it'd be nice to have dreams. So they may have more dreams. Other people will that have dreams have dreams, and they find that once we get to a higher dose, that their dreams are just too vivid so that in the morning they feel a little tired. So we cut the dose back. We continue at that dose where they do not have vivid dreams, and then we're able to increase the dose weeks later, and the vivid dreams don't tend to be there. But I haven't had any patients have to discontinue the use of it because of side effects. Um, it's just the tailoring of it and slowly incremental increases to decrease the vivid dreams. But again, that's in probably 1% to 5% of my patients, so mm. it's very low and minimal. Yes, I mean, I, I think we found when we did a survey a few years back that it was only 5% of people who t- had taken part in the survey that experienced any side effects. So mm-hmm. patients that come to I would to agree. <laughs> that's good. So patients that come to you that have been taking opiates, uh, what do you do um, to get them off the opiates for LDN? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I usually put them on a detox protocol for most of my patients. So when we're looking at a detox protocol, I'm looking at things to support the liver. When anybody's on an opioid, that can be quite damaging to the body. And we don't want to be mixing both of those together. So I usually do a, a de- it's basically called my detox protocol, where we put them on a certain diet that's going to help nourish the liver with high cruciferous vegetables, so the broccoli and cauliflowers and so forth. And we have our nutritionist work with our patients regarding that. And then we would look at different tinctures or formulas that can, again, help with a phase one and phase two detox of the liver. And then with some of our patients, we would give them a Myers cocktail. A Myers cocktail involves an intravenous solution, a saline solution, and then we add vitamin C, B vitamins to it, as well as some minerals and some homeopathics from Germany to, again, stimulate the detoxification process so that as they do reduce their opioid consumption, that their body's able to detoxify properly. Well, it's really interesting. So once they get on LDN, and I know that obviously your program and your protocol is individual for each patient, but if you had to say for our listeners what you would consider um the main supplements to take alongside of LDN, <clears throat> what would they be? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, you're right. Each person is completely individual and each protocol that I have right now, it would be a different a different situation. But if somebody does ask me generally what is the number one thing that I should be taking for a vitamin? Should it be a multivitamin? Because a lot of my patients will come in and they'll say, I'm taking a multivitamin. That's what I was told as a kid. That's what I should be taking. (laughs) And that's usually one of the things I say, as soon as you're done your multivitamin, I don't want you to buy it again. Number one, I just want you to eat healthy. That's the number one thing we want to be focusing on is eating healthy. But when it comes to supplements, the number one supplements that Canadians, as well as most Europeans that are in rainy places like London or England, just like Vancouver, which rains most of the time, they're going to be <laughs> lacking vitamin D. Mm-hmm. So for LDN, again, and if we think about LDN being used for a lot of our autoimmune patients, so that's when the body attacks itself, what we find is that studies show that people with autoimmune issues, 70% of them have low vitamin D levels which is astonishing. So it's not that vitamin D can reverse your autoimmune issue, but if you're taking vitamin D, you have a very good chance of not getting an autoimmune issue. 
So for all my patients, I recommend vitamin D. So that definitely is going to be helping preventing the autoimmune issues. It helps with the immune system. It's a fat-soluble hormone. But vitamin D and a probiotic are probably my two things that every patient needs to be on that are not getting adequate sun. If you're going to Hawaii or you're going to warmer climates, then that's great and you're getting your sun. But vitamin D and probiotics is the one-two punch that you need to be taking with LDN. Mm -hmm. What dose of vitamin D do you recommend? I recommend for most of the patients that are not getting sun. Again, it de it's weight dependent. Um, so be aware of that and something to talk about with your physician. You can also get your vitamin D levels tested with your physician if you think you have adequate amounts. Uh, vitamin D is very, very cheap, so it's not an expensive supplement by any means. It is worth its weight in gold, but vitamin D levels can be tested. And the recommended dose in Canada from the Canadian government is 1,000 international units. Don't forget that is a government minimum standard. So I'm usually dosing my patients at 3,000 international units to start. But again, you should be talking to your healthcare provider to get your levels tested to determine the right amount that you need. And then from there, six months later or a few months later, you can test again to determine if what you're getting is adequate or not to make sure it's right for you. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned diet there. What would you say is a healthy way of eating for somebody with an autoimmune disease? Well, there's lots of different avenues we can go. One of the things that I do with my patients is I do something called a food sensitivity test. So what we're looking at is something called IgG, immunoglobulin G. So these are white blood cells. So with my patients that come in with autoimmune issues, what we do is we take their blood, we send it to a lab, and we get it analyzed. And again, they look at the white blood cells and how their blood reacts with different foods. Uh, a couple of weeks later, we get our nutritionist to work with their nutritionist so that we have a program with our patients so that we're looking at what foods is right for them. Because you can have five patients with five different autoimmune issues or five same autoimmune issues, and they can all have different food sensitivities. So again, we try to make it custom. We can generally say, take out dairy, take out gluten, but generally speaking, that should work. However, everybody has different triggers. Maybe for one person, they need to take tomatoes out of their diet. For others, it could be the nightshade, such as eggplants or eggs or um, cheese. It, it could be something different for each person, and that's why we confirm it by doing a food sensitivity test. We have our patients generally take out the known culprits, like I alluded to earlier, gluten and dairy, while we wait for the results to come back. Generally, those ones are still positive, but if they're not, we usually look for other things that could be a trigger. When we look at somebody's diet, they eat three to five times per day. So with autoimmune issues, again, you look at any of the major medical clinics and journals out there, there's no particular reason for why we have autoimmune issues. However, generally and clinically speaking, you know, there's common denominators. It can be stress. So people that have high stress jobs or family situations, uh, that can be a trigger for some people's autoimmune issues or being in a car accident or a uh, dramatic situation, uh, physically or mentally, so any type of relationship that could be a trigger. For other people, it could be purely food consumption that could be a major trigger. For others, it could be hereditary. But there's a lot of different factors that can be causing these autoimmune issues. But we definitely want to control the dietary factors because that is something we have control over. Mm -hmm. And what about exercise? What do you recommend for your patients? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a really good question and a good point. Yes, uh, exercise is going to be huge and something that we do encourage with our patients. Uh, adequate amounts of it is going to reduce our stress levels. So we have these two little glands called our adrenal glands that sit above our kidneys, and they produce cortisol and adrenaline. When we have high stress moments or when we're scared, our cortisol or adrenaline levels go up. If over long periods of time we have high stress levels, high cortisol levels, what we tend to find is that these people are going to be more situated to have adrenal burnout or put themselves more in a situation for an autoimmune issue. So when we're thinking about our patients that have high stress levels, by exercising daily, that's a great way at reducing cortisol levels. The other thing we could be looking at is something called adaptogenic curves. So these would be anything from Eleutherococcus, Panax ginseng, uh, Siberian ginseng, 
uh, rhodiola. And these are great modulators to reducing cortisol levels, so high stress levels, so that people are able to manage their stress levels much better. Hmm. That's interesting. So when a patient comes to you initially for the first consultation, how long does that consultation last? So our initial consultations usually last one hour. We have them come in one hour with myself. Uh, We usually have our patients come in for general lab testing when they first come in. So when they come in, we do the typical blood pressure, um, heart rate, oxygen saturation, and then we do a blood picture with our patients where we take a small sample of blood to see what could be going on with general screening for a toxicity screen of their blood. We also use a machine called the Max Pulse Test, and that's a cardiovascular screen. And then from there, we use an algorithm based on their heart rate uh, to look at what their physical, mental, and stress levels can be as well. So it's just a way of gathering more information. Um, with they spend time with me, we're going to be again doing lots of questions. The more information I can get from a patient, the more of an idea I can see what's going on. Uh, five, 10 minute visits, I'm not going to get an idea of how I can tailor this program specifically to them. So I find 45 minutes to 60 minutes gives me adequate time to again tailor it because one person's autoimmune issues is going to be different than somebody else's. And we have to look at the root problem and look at specific nutritional deficiencies or immunological deficiencies or issues that we need to address. And most people are different. So it's important for us to get that right by asking the right questions and enough of them. Mm. So you actually start with a baseline and know where the patient is at the point of them coming to see you. And then you can build on that with their individualized protocol. Exactly. Our first visit usually takes about an hour, and then I like to follow up with my patients two to three weeks later. Um, If it is, like we're talking about an autoimmune issue and they're a candidate for low-dose naltroxone, then we would put them on that for a couple of weeks and see if we can increase the dose. Um, I imagine your listeners are well aware of the dosing, but we would start, again, like I said, most of our patients at one milligram to 1.5 milligrams. And we tend to keep our patients at that dose for as long as possible for getting success with it, um, which is great. And for some of our patients, it could be pain. So if their pain goes down at 1.5 milligrams, that's perfect. So we would keep them on that for as long as possible. If after a few weeks, we don't notice a difference at 1.5 milligrams, then I tend to increase the dose to three milligrams. And then again, if that helps subside the pain, if that's what their complaint is, we keep them at that. The therapeutic range that we find the most success with is 4.5 milligrams. So we don't tend to go higher than that. We haven't seen any beneficial studies showing that. Um, One of the new things, though, which is great, Linda, that I'm doing with my patients now, is I'm able to use naltroxone in different forms. So you can take it orally at night, yes, but I'm starting to use it now as a cream base as well. So that's really interesting for my psoriasis patients. So just to remind our listeners that psoriasis, again, is going to be an overproduction of cells that tends to be on the outside, the extensors of our knees and elbows. So it's a white flaky skin that's just it's overproducing too fast. The body's immune system is just hyper, hyperactive. So using nodose naltroxone works extremely well internally, but I also get it compounded so that they can put it on a cream externally. So we're hitting it from an internal and external front to really help our patients. Uh, get better results with psoriasis. So that's one of the newer things that I'm doing with patients. Um, I'm also starting to use nitroxone in a, again, in a cream base for post-surgery scars. And I'm finding really great results with that. So it's amazing to see how scars can be diminished in size just with the cream alone. And I'm also using it uh, orally as well, internally. So it's neat to see that one, two, one, two approach. Wow. That's the first time I've heard somebody say they had used um, LDN for scars. So that's amazing. I just wanted to ask you, out of curiosity, I've interviewed several patients who've used LDN for psoriasis. And many have told me that they haven't had good results until they've been on it like five to six months. What's been your experience with the success rate? Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I think that's why I've just recently started using it as a cream as well because of the amount of time it took to balance and slow down that immune system. We have to remember with psoriasis, 
that immune system is just so amped up. It's going so fast. The cells are overproducing that the LDN is an immune regulator. So it's helping to slow down and balance those Th1, 2H2, Th2 receptors, the helper cells. However, um, using this cream, I do find accelerates it much quicker. So your listeners, I would like them to try try asking their doctor for a cream as well, getting them both as an oral form and uh, as a cream form and seeing, and they should see results in, in less than half the time. Wow, that's... Um, as little as 10 wow. weeks, uh, maybe even three weeks, but everybody is different. Again, with those psoriasis patients, we have to be looking at their factors. Um, don't smoke. You know, we need to look at our diet. Don't have those double big gulps from 7-Eleven or McDonald's. We really need to be looking at the factors that's causing those cells to be overstimulated. The cause is key, and a low-dose naltroxin is a key factor in helping that out, but we've got to look at what the triggers are for the psoriasis. Mm -hmm. And do you see children, or are you a, a naturopathic doctor who sees adults only? I see children as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And have you used LDN on children? I've only used LDN as a cream on children. I have not used it orally with children. Mm -hmm. And with the children that we've used it on was more of an eczema base. And what I tend to find with eczema, it's usually we have three reasons or causes for eczema. Um, most of the time, 60% of the time, it's diet related. For some children, um, again, not children, but adults, it would be stress related. And then the other type of eczema we see is a contact dermatitis, meaning when they put on, it could be their wrist or near their belly button, but it's as simple as they're wearing a gold-plated watch, they're sensitive to gold, or maybe it's a copper belt buckle, and that's what's causing it. But um, I have used it as a cream base with children, and again, that's only recently that I started using the cream, because it's, it's a novel idea um, to do it that way. So um, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with using it in multi a multifaceted way now. Mm -hmm. I know many doctors who use LDN on children, for autism and rub it on the back of their hands mm. before, before bedtime and find very good results with that. So I'm just trying to work out in my head. Um, so when the patient comes to see you, you take their full record, you sort out supplements and diet and exercise. What else do you recommend they do? Is there anything or is that it? I mean, the more lab testing we can do, the better. And we, I find lab testing just gives us more information to fill in any of the gaps that we're aware of or not aware of. So, again, for some of our patients, we want to just do a routine blood screening just to figure out what could be going on. So doing everything from a CBC to a chemistry panel, that's going to give us our white and red blood cells. It's also going to give us an idea of the kidney and liver function just to make sure that everything is looking ideal. It's not a bad idea to get our B12 and ferritin, which is our iron levels, to get those tested as well so we're not missing anything. Um, I alluded to vitamin D testing earlier as well because that's so important with autoimmune issues. So those would be the basic screening tests I would do for the average patient. However, if we do want to be more specific, we could do other lab tests, uh, blood tests as well, looking at immune bodies. So if we want to look at rheumatoid arthritis, um, ESR or C-reactive protein, um, rheumatoid factor or other things we'd want to look at as well. So getting proper lab testing with your medical doctor is going to be key. Uh, we routinely do that with our patients, not to mention the food sensitivity testing I alluded to earlier. And then there's another great test that we use to look at the cortisol. Those are the, that's the uh, hormone produced from those adrenal glands that sit above our kidneys. We do a test with that with our patients and it's a saliva test. And that's a great test that a patient would do in the morning, noon, afternoon and at bedtime and it gives us an idea of how their cortisol how their hormone varies throughout the day and ideally we should have high cortisol in the morning and if you've ever been around a three-year-old kid you'll know that in the morning they jump out of bed they have so much energy <laughs> and that's ideally how our curve should be really high in the morning and then slowly go down and then by eight nine o'clock as a three-year-old does they crash and that's ideal what tends to happen is that in a go, go, go society where we have internet, we have email, we're checking it right before bed, is that when I'm doing my cortisol test with my patients, their cortisol levels are so wonky. Some of them have high cortisol all through the day, so they're wired but tired. I also have my 
other patients that in the morning they need a cup of coffee every hour to get them going, which is quite common in today's society. Let's get a big, you know, latte or whatever it's going to be from Starbucks and they drink their coffee throughout the day and then at night they can't sleep. And then I have the next stage of my patients, which are just burnt out of 20 years of burning the candle at both ends that just have no energy. And that's the adrenal fatigue picture. So doing a test like that helps to confirm with the symptoms that the patient tells me with what exactly is going on. And then by rebuilding those adrenal glands, whether it's nutrition, diet, lifestyle, acupuncture, there's so many avenues we can look at. Um, we can retest them six months, 12 months later, and see how those adrenal glands are producing appropriate amounts of cortisol and to show them that they are getting better. And they start to feel better too, which is the best part. Uh, but it's nice to have something objective as well to show them how they're doing and how it's working. Mm. You said something really interesting there. And you're so right. I mean, things have changed. Even in the last few years, everybody tends to have a smartphone or an iPad computer. And like you say, they're checking emails, messages. I'm not a great big fan of Facebook, but I know a lot of people have to put on there absolutely everything and keep up to date with what their friends have been doing. If people are producing too much cortisol because they're not winding down in the evening, getting ready for sleep, having too much coffee and stimulants um if people naturally want to feel tired at bedtime what would you say about electronic devices and and computer games and things to actually let the mind rest before bed so you felt tired what would you say would be a good idea to say okay i go to bed at 10 o'clock and i should turn my phone and everything off and maybe read and relax or listen to some music or something before I go to bed rather than focusing your mind on social media. Yeah, I would completely agree with, with your suggestions. The big thing that we do with our clinic, again, with that first visit is the diet, but the sleep. So we have a section in our talk, in my discussion with my patients, where I go over sleep hygiene. So what does sleep hygiene mean? Well, it alludes to some of the things that you were just alluding to. So a couple of the things that we talk about in our sleep hygiene protocol is no TV, no internet an hour before bed. Mm -hmm. So that's key. Also to dim the lights as we're getting ready for bed. We don't need to have all the lights on right until we go to bed. We want to start setting the mood just as if we didn't have electricity, which is relatively new. It's not been around for thousands and thousands of years and evolution takes time. So with us, with our patients, we tell them to dim the lights as it's getting later in the day. No TV, no internet. Keep the bedroom just for sex and sleeping. We don't want people working in their bedroom, uh, typing on their computer, watching movies or TV in their bedroom. Uh, having blackout blinds is another suggestion. We want the room to be as dark as possible. It's tough for living in major cities where there's so many night lights outside or street lights, but blacking that out as much as possible is great. If you can, putting your smartphone on airplane mode or leaving it outside the room just to remove any Wi-Fi signals or extra signals that could be coming in. Some patients, especially if we're looking at even autism, children are quite sensitive to different things. So we just want to reduce the amount of burden and overload that the body has just to make it as simple as possible. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. And I'm sure our listeners will really appreciate um, all the sensible advice that you've offered there. If anybody is in your area, um, I don't know whether you do face-to-face -face or whether you would do telephone consultations, but how would people get hold of you? What is your website and your phone number? Yeah, so I would, I can do, I prefer face-to-face -face only because then I can do hands-on with my patients. However, there's not an issue with doing remote. We have lots of patients that fly over to see us at our clinic. Um, so we can do that as well as phone consultations and always send you to the appropriate lab if needed as well. But I will give my information for you as well so you can pass it on to your practitioners. I'm at Amakua Integrated Wellness Clinic. I'm located in Vancouver, British Columbia. And the phone number, if you would like more information regarding any of my treatment protocols or any questions I could have uh, to answer for your patients, the phone number is area code 604 
0800-684-6565. Thank you very much. We will have to have you back another day answering um, callers' questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Linda, for having me. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. The LDN 2017 conference will be held in Portland, Oregon, in the US, 22nd to the 24th of September. If you are unable to attend in person, we'll bring the conference to you, regardless where you live. You can participate via our live stream. Check out www.ldn2017.com for early bird discounts. The conference will examine life-changing breakthroughs for treating multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, colitis, autism, irritable bowel syndrome, lupus, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic pain, mental health issues, restless leg syndrome and many other conditions using low-dose naltrexone. For tickets, live stream and sponsorship opportunities, go to www.ldn2017.com. Today's show sponsor, Care First Speciality Pharmacy. They are leading compounders of LDN and other custom treatments servicing patients in over 18 states coast to coast. They are widely accredited to provide you with the highest quality demanded by the industry and the expert service you expect. To learn more, call 844-822-7379 or visit cfspharmacy.com. Any questions or comments you may have, please email me, linda, L-I-N-D-A, at ldnrt.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciated your company. Until next time, stay safe and keep well.